Welcome to Central St Martins, which is one of the six colleges of University of the Arts London. And I know some of you probably haven't been here before, so um, the colleges um, almost entirely do um, teaching and research in art, design, communication, film, fashion, photography, media, and various other things I can't remember. Um, and not sociology not much sociology. Uh, my name is Lucy Kimball. I'm director of the Innovation Insights Hub, which is a small UAL um, sort of research center, research hub. Um, and this is um, one of a series of events we have on the theme of future imaginaries. Um, tonight, um, you are here for Social Imaginaries, the reinvention of social research. And we have an illustrious panel um, from different disciplinary bases. Um, and as you know, we will also be celebrating the launch of Norch's new book. And there will be copies available to buy and presumably sign later and also some drinks. So why is this happening here? Um, well, on your way in, you may have noticed some stuff, some bits of mess. You may have had to walk around various things that look like and indeed art. This is actually the um, graduating show of the, the art students um, studying foundation that opens tomorrow. And um, there'll be something rather similar for the MA and, and BA students um, in about two weeks, and then an entirely different show about four weeks after that for the graduating design stu students. So this is what we are used to. This, in the space of a few days, some stuff is there, it's made, it's reproduced, and it is available and public. Um, and um, what those things are, if you're not used to um, looking at or making or teaching contemporary art and design, is they are not simply artifacts, they are not simply um, sculptures or videos or bits of textile. They are actually proposals for new ways of being, new ways of living, new ways of sharing, new ways of um, imagining um, futures that we, some of which may come into being. Um, so these kinds of practices are obviously creative. Um, some of us would say they're inventive through Celia um, Lurie and Wakeford's uh, term, re re reuse of that term inventive. They're digital and material as an, as an excess. Um, and this is actually entirely ordinary in, in this kind of environment. And it seemed like an interesting setting um, in order to reflect on the extent to which the digital offers a new way of knowing society. In art and design, we know things by making things, by trying to make new sets of relations in some artifactual fashion. Um, digital sociology, Norch's book argues, is also potentially about um, intervening and making some of those relations as well as studying them. So um, to join us in that discussion tonight, um, the format's going to be that Norch is going to speak for a few minutes, and then we have our panel who will speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, and since you know who they are, I'll just introduce them now so we've clarified the order. First, we'll have Les Back from Goldsmiths, then um, my colleague Amanda Windle from London College of Communication at UAL, then Mike Savage from LSE, and then finally Hannah Knox from UCL. Then finally, Norcia will have an open Q&A, and then we'll move on to the books and the drinks. Um, just to let you know, we are audio recording this event. Um, this will be then be available. Um, I think there's going to be a blog post by Evelyn. Is that right? Um, so the audio will be available and shareable uh, afterwards. Um, and I think that's it for now. And if you're on Twitter, the hashtag is um, digital sociology. OK, so if I'd like to invite Norcia to um, open this evening's event. Thank you. Yeah, me um, too. I wanted to start with uh, thanking uh, Lucy Kimball uh, for bringing us together here in this place um, for panel discussion um, about what I think are quite broad and also uh, diffuse issues um, to do with technology, society, knowledge, and the imagination. Um, and to take on this kind of diffuse issues um, at a time when so much attention in so many places is focused quite narrowly on elections, on the upcoming general election, yet another um, upcoming um, election. So I, I really appreciate that we can be in this open-ended environment to, to speak about digital sociology and also to mark uh, my book uh, being published. And uh, before we move to the uh, panel discussion, I wanted to say a few words about uh, the timing 
uh, of both the uh, writing of the book and the publish publication of it. Uh, because I um, submitted the manuscript um, shortly after uh, the Brexit uh, result um, became known and a, while, a little while before um, the Trump election. And of course, um, I asked myself uh, after submitting the manuscript and as events unfolded, how um, and whether my book relates to or perhaps even anticipates uh, some of these events. Um, and I think it does uh, anticipate some of these political events. And so I'd like to use my five minutes, and uh, I do hope Lucy's gonna tell me when I got there, uh, to, to say, uh, yeah, to talk to you about how I th think it relates and also then briefly touch on this question of the imagination. Because uh, to explain recent election results, uh, there has been a lot of debate about the role of social media and uh, other digital platforms in the elections. Uh, most famously, BuzzFeed reported in November 2016 that fake news outperformed uh, traditional news reporting um, on social media in the run-up to the presidential election um, um, yeah, in the US. So, um, non-traditional sources were shared uh, and followed uh, more widely and more intensely than established uh, news. Now, this then became the occasion for tech industries and all sorts of uh, related organizations to announce a string of efforts which can broadly fit uh, in the category of digital sociology to um, use tools of data analysis uh, to somehow mitigate this uh, troubling uh, and um, damaging um, dynamic. So there are now uh, and have long been uh, fact-checking services, tools for tracing dark posts on Facebooks, announcements of new ways of blocking uh, manipul manipulative content online, and I think that digital sociology um, can make a contribution to understanding why these kind of efforts, these kind of piecemeal uh, technical solutions um, to combat online opinion manipulation, why these solutions don't go to the heart of the problem. So, and I want to do a little stage setting before trying to get to the problem. Um, because I think there's a lot of research um, which also could be put in the category of digital sociology, which shows how these technical solutions or these digital analytic um, solutions um, don't really deal effectively with the problem. So there's the work by Jonathan Gray and others uh, for the Public Data Lab, uh, in which uh, Lucy Kimball is also um, a member on fake news, which has shown that the communities in which fake news circulates and the communities in which fact-checking services and uh, transparency tools find uptake, that these are two separate communities. So that, in fact, fake news and the services to mitigate against it, fact-checking, address different publics. Um, they also make the very important uh, argument, I think, and it's a point that also comes up uh, in my book, that the problem, a lot of problems with digital platforms and uh, the dynamics on digital platforms don't actually can be, um, they can be traced back to a particular logic uh, of digital platforms, which is a logic of instant sharing so, so both search engines and social media, they reward content that is instantly shareable, meaning that can find wide uptake quickly. They reward this kind of content with visibility and also with the opportunity to gain yet, yet more of an audience. Now, it means that a lot of the, the, the problems with fake news do not only have to do with the quality of that content, or even with the particular mode of circulation of that content, they have to do um, with this 
um, this, these logics of shareability, which mean that numerous people and the widest po uh, possible communities get implicating in the sharing of it. So fake news only gets as influential as those willing to share it are numerous. Um, <coughs> so there is this social, which I think is a social aspect uh, to it. Now I'm going to think of the clock on the wall and I have one more minute. You good. Can have, you can have more. <laughs> it's your event. Well, I think it's good to keep that in mind. Um, because, um, yeah, so I'm going to um, try and s speed up a little bit in that these logics of instant sharing are, even though we often speak of the behaviors of the users that participate in it, these are logics that also very much derive from a scientific imagination of digital phenomena, online phenomena. So how did instant sharing get hardwired into digital problems, uh, digital platforms? How did it become a central principle for making content visible? The logic of instant sharing derives from mo models in physics and biology, such as logics of swarming and crowd formation. Um, and it is, I think it is fair to say for us um, that a lot of these logics derive from a way of knowing society that is very little, has very little interest in the specificity of social phenomena. So swarms and viruses operate like birds and um, uh, or viral me media operate like viruses and swarms operate like birds. And to grasp those dynamics and to set them into motion, one needs very little appreciation for what's specific to political and social processes as opposed to these biological phenomena. And so what I'd like to think with, uh, what I'd like to think is that in a way, even though these problems that I am um, touching upon are very serious, um, that they are also problems that in, in a roundabout way demonstrate the importance of a sociological appreciation um, of processes of communication and um, circulation. Now, I'm going to leave some examples uh, for later. Um, and I just want to mention one uh, very last uh, problem that I have uh, with these logics that I've um, just invoked and that I think digital sociology um, <coughs> criticizes but also can offer alternatives to. And this is that the forms of knowledge that are implied uh, by the approaches that I've just invoked. Because if there's something problematic about studying online phenomena as the behavior of a crowd or as uh, the spread of a virus, it is that it also implies a particular division between those who know and those who beha whose behaviors are being either studied or um, 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 facilitated. So you could say that this kind of a behavioral science um, that has such uh, influence in digital industries, it re-entrenches a particular divide between subjects and users whose actions are influenceable, um, whose behavior is the, the, the target of attempts to influence them, and those big data analysts who know and who are not themselves vulnerable to these kind of dynamics of influence because they have knowledge. And it, strike me, it strikes me in that way that there is a lot of confluence between these problems around fake news and the ideals of a behavioral social science or a behavioral computational social science, which, which all revolve around this entrenching of differences between a mere social behavior and a scientific knowledge that is beyond that mere behavior. And this is why I uh, placed 
at the center, I think, of the blurb for this event, the point that knowledge is a social process, uh, that knowledge involves collaboration, because I think it is these ideas that in some way are trivial are very much an antidote to that kind of divide that I just invoked. I'm not going to say more. Instead, I'm going to say that I'm very pleased that uh, the four of you are here um, to uh, yeah, comment on this broader theme of the reinvention of social research. Yeah. So we now uh, turn to Les Bank from Goldsmiths. Thanks very much. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, and it's particularly wonderful to be here at this launch of um, the Ottoman Multimodal Digital uh, Installation, or a hashtag. <laughs> a book. An old school book that you can buy for £12. Wow. Also a book that is an argument about the digital world and about the social world and the mutual implication of both of those things. But that's also argued, and, and I mean this in the highest, as a highest compliment actually, in a very careful um, form of scholarly explication in the best sense. I think this, so my comments really tonight are, are thinking with the book and uh, a development of, of why it, the book offers us something really precious in our moment. My talk is called, and I won't go over 10 minutes, I hope, Digital Sociology is a Form of Awareness, Nothing More, Nothing Less. Of course, it's a quote from Nortra's book. There's still something, I think, of a reluctance in the academic world that is still built of paper, as much as I love paper, to really face how much digital culture has transformed the informational environment within which we're operating. My simple opening point is that digital sociology is not some fringe subspecialism, rather it is integral and necessary for any adequate understanding of the social. The social isn't exhausted by the digital, but digital social life is social life. And in a way, I think Nortra points towards this when she says, digital sociology is a form of awareness, nothing more, nothing less. Or put it another way, we are already inside the thing we're trying to understand. And, I, and that's what I took from your initial point, Nortra. I think maybe we've always been inside the social world, but our new information as we've tried to understand it, but our new informational environment makes those fantasies of trying to stand outside of society as onlookers or impartial watchdogs or the real experts of the profusion of big data just plain ridiculous. We are just a Google away from having our cover blown. The other thing that I take from Nortra's really important book is that this digital sociology as a form of awareness affords possibility and not just anxiety. But those post possibilities are not easy or straightforward. And I think Nortra does some very important and useful myth bu busting in the book that I think is really important. Now, the first and perhaps most uh, simple in a way is that digital culture doesn't uh, offer a new kind of technological fix for understanding the shape of society. Rather, what she stresses that I think is really important is how the digital occasion reconfigures the relationship between social life and social analysis across disciplines. So it's not just a matter of new tools, ways of scraping, harvesting the patterns of life in action captured in mass storehouses of big data, but also furnishing a critical imagination that does not fit within the standard architecture of disciplines. And this is a really big challenge and one that I know Nortra has been keenly attentive to. Her book foregrounds the importance of thinking about the role of social research in fostering skills that cross and combine sociology, computational studies, design and art. 
The digital makes possible new ways of monitoring and, and, and analysing and intervening in social life. This is one of the edges of, Dor of Norch's argument, I think. Critics have pointed to the new forms of surveillance and control that this makes possible in these new types of data economies. And Norcha generously talks about one example from a project that I'm still trying to finish on the use of uh, technology in, and mobile phones in immigration surveillance and monitoring. I'm not going to rehearse the example that she use, uses. You can find it on page 31 to 33 if you're curious. But I do want to try and uh, use that example as a way of illustrating what I think is valuable in what Nortcher is pointing us towards. And I want to try and illustrate it by imagining two very different airport scenarios. In 2009, one of the participants in our study was informed by the UK border agency, now absorbed into the Home Office, that they had no longer leave to remain in Britain. They asked him to leave. And they asked him to provide the flight details of when he planned to fly from London. On Facebook, he informed his friends he was coming home. He made plans, he booked his flight, and duly informed the Home Office. Christian made his way to the airport and prepared to leave Britain. After stowing his luggage in an overhead compartment, he felt his mobile phone vibrate in his pocket. He settled into his seat for the flight. Before turning his phone off, Christian looked down and checked the new text message. To his surprise, it was from UKBA, or at least he thought it was at the time. It read, have a pleasant journey. The politeness of the British immigration officials that had questioned and scrutinised him previously was somehow the hardest thing to take. Christian's story is emblematic of the new realities of border control and the mediums of policing immigration. The technologies of bordering are as mobile as the migrants. In a hyper-connected world, the regulation of movement is more complex and technologically sophisticated than perhaps ever before. Without papers, undocumented migrants can try and live undetected within the anonymity of a city like London. While if they apply for leave to remain, they become traceable. There are other ways they can become traceable too and face institutionalised forms of marginalisation as a consequence. They have to live with a sense of insecurity enhanced by the mobile phone in the palm of their hand or in their pocket. And in a way, I think that points to those combinations, if you like, of the digital and, and of the informational in the experience of movement in our moment. But the creation of new forms of knowledge about social life and the emergence of digital infrastructures have another possibility too, another kind of action, or play another kind of part in the choreography and the play of confinement and escape. Suyad Osirin's brilliant ethnography of migrant experience in Istanbul just demonstrates how all these interlink. She describes how in Turkey, it's the airlines and not the immigration officers that are the key players in policing the boundaries of Europe. Not the immigration officers, the airlines. Because it's the airlines who are fined if they deposit people on EU, EU soil who don't have the requisite papers. They're the ones who are penalised. And Suad tells the story of another mobile phone user, 18-year-old Khaled, who is, in her, in her words, mousy-haired and blue-eyed, a Syrian travelling on a Belgium look-alike look passport. A simsar, an Arabic word for smuggler, acts as a kind of coach to help Khaled get through the airport checks. But in order to do this, he has to embody and perform a kind of European whiteness. He has to try and pass as being white and Belgium. Suryad writes, 
He styles his hair with some gel and picked up his carry-on suitcase and backpack to look like a young traveller in Istanbul on a short visit. He and the Samsar took a taxi to Atatürk Airport. The Samsar gave him instructions along the way of what to do once he passes it, passport control. Khaled would still have his mobile phone with him, but the Samsar wanted to tell him before they got to the airport as no one could listen in on the conversation in the car. Every half an hour, Khaled talks to the Samsar on his mobile phone. The smartphone is how he navigates this choreography, this racialized dramaturgy, if you like, as he's trying to pass as white. He gets on the plane almost to the point of departure, the moment when Christian receives his text, goes down the aisle but can't find his seat. The steward spoke to him in French, who Ed remembers, and Khaled looked at him trying to mask his confusion and nervousness. The steward tried again and then switched to English. The steward asked Khaled for his passport. Khaled still frozen as the air hostess took his lookalike passport from his hands. The steward called out to the air hostess and within minutes, Khaled was taken off the aeroplane. Yeah, can you see? In a way, this, these movements across you know, the, the border zones, if you like, are places where the digital and the informational and the everyday and the embodied are completely enmeshed. On the one hand, the smartphone is a way of trying to navigate and get through and pass and breach those boundaries while they can also serve as the modes through which these forms of control and policing operate. In a way, I think, the, the kinds of attentiveness and awareness that Nurture is pointing us to makes us think differently about the nature of migrant experience itself. This is about the choreography of identities that are confined or defined as either in or out of place. This world of divided connectedness is incomprehensible without an understanding of the place of the smartphone and the complex implication of movements of information, the role of data, knowledge and power. And in a way, it, I just wanted to say a few words about those stories to link them to perhaps a field beyond which we usually associate with digital sociology. And I feel very um, you know, privileged, actually, to have been in a space where uh, my own imagination can be furnished differently by working with and teaching with uh, Nurture. And that's why anyone who is interested in understanding social life can turn something important about reading this, about the world that we are, and we train our passions on through reading this valuable book. Thank you. Thank you. And now um, it's my turn of my colleague, Amanda Windle from UAL. I'm gonna start with two quotes uh, for a feminist response to digital sociology for a situated book panel critique. Uh, I'm gonna start with Kate Zambrino's Heroines. I uh, quote, I am beginning to realize that taking the self out of our essays is a form of repression. Taking the self out feels like obeying a gag order, pretending an objectivity where there is nothing objective about the experience of confronting and engaging with and swooning over literature. And now I'm going to quote Nortcher from Nortcher's book. I will propose that we need to get deeper into this trouble before we can get out of it. If we are to grasp the methodological implications of the digital for social inquiry, we must begin by recognizing that in many cases, the digital does not feature as either an object or instrument of social inquiry, but precisely as a bit of both. And in many other capacities as well, which we must interrogate, I will then propose that we must stay with the trouble. And I hear you echoing Donna Haraway in that. I chose digital research because of ill health. I could conduct interviews with machines by my bed, and I could search from the couch for relevant literatures. 
I stand looking very healthy today because I made a few simple changes I made to my life. I thought deeply about how and what I'd choose to research, whose company I'd keep, and also because of a new steroid called budesonide, a brand new drug costing weekly 100 euros a decade, a year, a decade ago. In the introduction of the book, Norche, you asked me a neat, or you ask a neat question, what is digital sociology? And I ask myself, whose company am I with? And I'll add to this a second question, whose digital sociology is this that I'm reading? And when repeating this question in relation to a situated reading done for this book panel here, I ask, what is digital sociology for this art, design, and communication, and all the other things I can't remember, environment? To take up one of the three directions of digital sociology methods that Nurture has, I will expand on situated practices of digital sociology, the thread that connects the work to Suchman, Lave, and Wenger. My presentation is a story of companionship and a tale of two book launches from my own perspective. I will come very close to presenting what Nurture warns about, an inward-looking sociological investigation. But this is a book panel, and I'm arguing that we should expand research on our academic sharedness. Inspired by Helen Varan's recent Silenced Issues blog post on the work of Susan Lee Starr and the work of Ill Health for Back Channels, I'm going to approach your topic of digital sociology so as to raise issues about health and well-being while interweaving the digital. When Nurture and I met to discuss my contribution to this panel, we talked about how I might extend the chapter in practice. This boded well, that is, until I realized that I was going to be in the situation of extending the arts practice of an ex-lover of mine. And Nurture, your reaction at that time said it all, you really didn't know this. And at that time in our conversation, I didn't want to stay with the trouble. So my mode of repair to talk ethnomethodologically about speech acts was to move the discussion on to talk about the contributions that the other panelists today might make. I'll now return to the topic, now to stay a little with the trouble for a while, and that's why it's over 10 minutes. I'd like to draw your attention to Norch's exemplary reading of sociological texts. She draws on arguments about social media from George Simmel's notion of triadic closure, closure where if one person knows two people, they're likely to know each other. So there was indeed one of many triadic closures that occurred to me in reading this book because books gather friends, colleagues, workers, lovers, and dust. There are familiar digital methods and also many companions in this book, so many more than to attend just to the figure of an X. Your book for me is as much about the reinvention of methods and practices of controversy as it is about digital sociology. And anyone who has read your work previously will know that you are a world leading academic on controversy in publics. And I've appreciated your clear captions and use of novel data visualizations that extend the practice of Howard Becker and Richard Rogers. But like, I'd like to move away from hetero patriarchal referencing for a moment to talk about your work. Any practitioner that hasn't had a chance to read your work before you should start with a catalog for an exhibition called Making Things Public because it's really helpful for those not trained in sociology or even research. Making Things Public took place in Germany where I got cautioned by a security guard for pinching too many badges from Lucy Kimball's exhibition in the same show whose badges I wore for many years while teaching graphic design and which inspired dozens of design projects. So that's my first digression about companionship for design. And now for my second. One evening, I was where you all sit now in the audience, listening eagerly about Michael Guggenheim's book and intently focused on Norch's comments to Michael in a venue just down the road from here. Books are thick letters to friends, wrote Jean-Paul Sartre also wrote letters to Simone de Beauvoir. He, anyway, this was echoed by Michael Guggenheim, and he said this just before receiving the panel critics like this. Norcha, you, you were a panel on that night, and you emphasized that when in the company of academics we should debate, we should be critical. And what you say is crucial, yet so difficult to practice. After the panel finished, I remember eating the spinach and the beetroot salad and a rather good beer, it was a cheery summer's evening in the company of many academic companions. That night, beer in hand, however, I talked to an artist that I'd not seen for a long time. 
And I learned that a mutual friend of ours was very ill, the friend whom I will call Y, and we shared the same health condition. Over a dec ago, decade ago, X, the lover who appeared earlier in my talk, thought it would be a good idea if I met Y. The first time I met Y, X was preparing dinner for us. Y and I sat alone, and for a time, we just looked at each other. We didn't speak much, but looked at each other in the way that ill people do. We eventually talked about our health, as was the aim of the intervention, and we shared a key digit, our dates of diagnosis for not looming um, for, for, for health, but not the looming digits that you have in your book, loss of weight over time, which I'm citing a graphic from your book. Fat is a feminist issue. It's also, as Maris and Lurie, you point out a digital sociology issue in this book, but it's also an issue for those with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, UCCD. Had I been in the seminar you talk about in your book, Nortcher, I'd have raised a point about disability and digital ability there to say that it's deeply personal and difficult to open up in a first-time, face-to-face conversation and so much easier in a digital group or blog post. And for that reason, I find the research of endocrine disruption and in particular UCCD too inward-looking a research topic for me. Why and I discuss the leading research advancements in pharmaceuticals and surgery as researchers would and not about pain and depression. We never talked about our eating and bathroom habits, nor our preference for painkiller medication or addictions that may occur. He was a notable postdoctoral researcher and at that time reading digital microscopic imagery to advance his work on mycobacterium tuberculosis on how I quote, small heat shock proteins are a ubiquitous uh, family of stress proteins that have a role in the virulence and survival of pathogens. This is how the language of shock and stress repeat in digital records of social and te- uh, science and technology. Why and I did share, but not all of the invasive and often digitized medical experiences. Regardless of free healthcare in the UK and okay-ish statutory sick pay, we'd both be back at work the very next day after having our insides pulled and stretched. You'd get back on the tube, banged around on busy carriages that care more for the space to read their data publicly on glass surfaces than care for general personal body space. I'm drawing on Kemba's uh, term glass here, and at this moment I also appreciate your phrase, Nortcher, of being device aware. But you actually say device aware sociology, which I'd argue extends and opens up beyond sociological research and beyond academic labour and into our everyday lives. For all those passengers on trains suffering from the inside that do not wear their needs as a badge to get a seat, for their sake, put your bag on the floor, hold on, and don't bang into people with your data because it hurts deeply. Two years from meeting why I went into remission and have been for over a decade now. Why, however, passed away between writing of this book launch uh, and and the one of Michael Guggenheim's book two years ago. It is the growing space between health and care, between these two printed books that mattered deeply in this request to become a panelist, so thank you. But when I asked to expand on the work of a chapter that contains the work of an artist that introduced me to why, I had to get deeper into the trouble. But how far do we stay with the trouble? Because I have an issue with what Donna Haraway suggests. In your book, you limits, you put set limits around reflexivity of not doing inward-looking investigations of sociological practice itself. But there is a strong ethical dimension to this phrase for further research. To go back to your research, not on controversy, up front in your book, you start with a deeply sociological topic of suicide. You reference the digital sociology of suicide notes on social media and the Durkheim project. So I'm glad that there is an extensive intertwining in your book to the work of Christine Hine, notably virtual ethnography, and that your final chapter asks the ethically infused question, does digital sociology have problems? In chapter five, you explore the question, who are digital sociology's publics? And you discuss the importance of both passive and active digital audiences and participatory research, which I think is open-ended enough for practice-based researchers. I'd like to ask you, Nortcher, how your research on controversy has impacted you, why you chose to embark on digital research on particular controversies and what advice you, would, you might give to those embarking on research projects in this regard, be they practically applied or practice-led. 
And I'm going to refer to Dorothy Nelkin, who wrote in Science and Technology and Human Values, whose writing about controversy is accessible in the digital archives that have now defaulted to digital, or more positively put, simply available online. Nelkin in 1978 wrote, when science becomes controversial, scientists inevitably become involved in political activity, taking sides and raising questions about the institutions that control the direction and application of research. So I'm going to summarize politically because we need to question the potential idealistic sense of democracy we might engage with. And when you say Nortcher, we examine ways in which research subjects may be involved as research participants. I, th I really want to, to, to think more about that. Choosing to be involved in certain action will change the way in which we research. So some of you are aware I've been writing for the New Statesman Tech and advocating for EU-UK funding scenario. And in doing this, some research threads, I'm just going to say threads, have, will now remain closed to me whilst others remain open. I found Chapter 5 leaning towards the radical end of the digital media practices and towards protest culture. I do think sometimes what gets missed in these excitable practices is the work of passive audiences. As a passive digital audience member, I benefited prior to social media from early online forum groups. However, the move to large corporate social media groups did disrupt some of the grassroots support networks, specifically when their digital infrastructures shifted during the noughties. Someone with UCCD doesn't always need their mood creepily enhanced by an algorithm on Facebook, but I do like some of the roaming mental health bots on Twitter, and you talk about these, Nortcher. This digital shift was, and still perhaps is, a substantially understudied area of digital sociology at the intersections of digital innovation, participatory action, and policies of citizen health and well-being. At the moment, I'm working on Twitter and WhatsApp research projects looking at women-only support networks in rapid response social media environments. But my own use of UCCD online communities reminds me of when they don't work because of that shift to Facebook. What I'm trying to do here is interlace, as you do, Norcha, a discussion about the passive and active register assigned to separating digital audiences and digital participation. When this book goes to second edition, and I'm sure it will, I'd like to bring to your attention the following. The trope of the outing of someone or something, on page 42 you say, uh, and I'm going to quote, the outing of digital technology is a notable dimension of social research. It felt like a feminist, queer or gender aware argument would emerge after the discussion from Haraway. And I hope that what would follow was the linking to the sociology, uh, socially oriented media literatures from say Sarah Kember, Kate Oriada and Caroline Bassett amongst others. At this point in your book, I used the index to check on the citations and I wondered also about Wakeford's work, which is subsequently introduced in the prose but is absent from the index. While your introduction is exemplary, I wasn't sure, so sure about the emboldened language, like shot through with ethical political issues and to this excitable speech. And finally, and very slowly, my points about participation lagged behind my points about illness, which got ahead, sped up, sped up by hetero acts. But then love fell behind, pain happened, and death came right up. As an active audience, I urge you, you out there, not to out X and Y with your digital devices, but rather to fill in the gaps Nortch's book opens up. Please attend to other silences in our academic sharedness. Digital materialities in media, design and sociology offers us opportunities to look at the heteropatriarchy in our reference systems in books and other web-based social media systems to attend to their indexes and taxonomies which pull together people like myself who are white but not that white, straight but not that straight, ill but not that ill, but who are already seen as way too much. Think about the stigma that is carried in the body the moment an author talks about the ways our academic sharedness might get fucked up, how our, bad, how our body participates in both front and behind our books, paper, digital, materiality, let's not silence the body in our shared digital research.
Thank you. And now Mike Savage from LSE. I think I should start really by, I think one of the reasons why Nortra invited me today was in 2007 I wrote this paper with Roger Burroughs called The Coming Crisis of Empirical Sociology and Nortra makes some uh, uh, respectfully critical remarks about it, I would say, which I think I very much uh, endorse. When Roger and I wrote this article 10 years ago, um, it came out of a, a casual conversation which we then kind of wrote up and it pitched perhaps unhelpfully, um, traditional social science methods, traditional, traditional sociological methods, interviewing surveys against kind of new methods, the digital, big data. We, the big data term wasn't invented then, but you know, those kinds of worlds. And the kind of the observation was, you know, all this stuff's happening, Google is happening, uh, and uh, amazing activity around web 2.0. We sociologists are still doing much the same as we've done for decades. Um, and this was always a controversial argument, and it's very instructive that um, the first, uh, when, we had, when we said the paper for review, one referee said, oh, these are really fantastically important observations about the way things are going. And the other one said, this is complete rubbish. You know, no, no reason why we publish these nonsense. And that, in a way, summarized the kind of very polarized uh, debate, which I think the, the paper partly encouraged. Um, and looking back now, and I think Norch's one of Norch's really important um, contributions in the book is to say that kind of binary is not very helpful in thinking about where we are positioned now uh, because it, it locks us into all sorts of ways of there's this new world out there which is threatening our old world um, and we've got to defend the old world um, rather than actually recognising it's a much more hybrid interface uh, and we've got to think productively not about are we for or against the digital but kind of how do we use the affordances of various kinds of digital devices, digital methods to do what we want to do in a new and different way. So I think that's a really important lesson and, and uh, I want to just try and, uh, in my uh, 10 minutes, just pursue this by talking about some research which I've been involved with uh, in the last few years at the LSC, pursuing the issue of inequality. Uh, and the argument I want to make is quite a simple one in a way. Um, Inequality research has been around a long time. Uh, you know, it's hardly a new thing. Uh, much of that research, historically, has been based in particular disciplines. So economists have done it one way. You know, Marxists have done it another way. Um, sociologists, Weberians have done it another way. It's been very siloed. Um, we are in a very interesting moment, I think, currently, that the issue of inequality is, what is one which is getting new, new debates going between different areas of specialism. And I think the potential is there for people to speak to each other around the issue of inequality who previously hadn't really been talking to each other. That's true both in terms of different disciplines, different methodological repertoires, different theoretical understandings and also kind of different kinds of publics, how we, how we construe that. And I've been very interested in thinking about, well, how, how is that happening? Um, and what are, the, what are the kind of repertoires which we can deploy to encourage, I think, I think we do need to encourage and reflect seriously about the issue of inequality, and that's, that's one thing I'm very concerned to do. And in thinking about that, and even you know, working at the LSC, the LSC is a very mainstream social science university, there's not much interest, in, if I'm honest, in questions of art and what I, what I call here the symphonic aesthetic. But I actually think uh, much of the kind of key contributions and much of the key interventions in debates around inequality have come from social scientists who are developing an aesthetic repertoire. So the, the imitation to the seminar got us to think about art and social science. I want to try and pursue this with three examples and make the point, well, a number of points. One of them is um, the, the work which I'm, going to, which I'm going to briefly say a few words about and which you probably come across um, uses the digital. So it's partly digital, but it's not just digital. It's just not as, I, as if it's either or. It, it wouldn't be imaginable at the level without the kind of digital world. Um, secondly, it, visualization is fundamental to it. And I think this, here's a really significant change happening in uh, research on inequality, which is that, well, actually, I'll be controversial just to throw something out. I think you could argue that much, much social science depends either upon narrative or upon kind of quantitative analyses of various kinds using tables and figures. And I think the world of inequality research is moving the focus to using visuals and you, people are arguing for positions and against positions by deploying different kinds of visuals. 
uh, which I don't, I'm not sure has happened before. And I think that is, again, something which the digital encourages, facilitates, but also um, it's not simply a digital phenomenon because I think what certain kinds of you know, purely computational big data people do is they have all sorts of visuals, but there's no narrative thrust linking the visuals together. So it's kind of one, one network diagram after another one. Um, and what uh, I think much of the research on inequality does is actually try and uh, link these visuals into what, what I call a symphonic aesthetic. And this is a term which I should say Susan Half of the South Southampton's been uh, working with me around. By symphonic aesthetic, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pursue this scene by just showing these three examples, and then um, we can discuss them. Thomas Piketty, you'd all have heard of him. Um, some of you may have tried to read his book, uh, Capital of the 21st Century, which I think is a really, it's a really interesting to look at that book sociologically. It's a, it's a university hardback, 800 pages long, uh, 25, 20 pounds, um, a million and a half copies sold. You know, and it's, it is not a work of fast social science. It's not, a, it's not a, it's not a work of, um, well, as Nortch was talking, crowdsourcing stuff. It's work based on 15 years scholarship, so it's very slow at one level. Um, but it is also uh, embedded, in, it could not have been done without various kinds of digital resources. So one of the crucial arguments about it is to say, if we're going to look at economic inequality, we can't use surveys, we have to use administrative data from taxation records. So Piketty and his team um, have assembled this kind of database of different nations using taxation records to look at um, inequality. But, and this is the point of the visual here, um, the way the book proceeds, and I'm in, I'll be interested to hear from any of you who've, who've read the book. It's a long book, it's you know, a bit turgid in places. But time and again you get these, these sort of visuals displayed. And the visuals are basically along the bottom, along the x-axis, periods of time. And the, the vertical axis, the y-axis, you get different, different measures of inequality. And time and again you get this U-shape. Um, and the U shape says, you know, 100, 100 odd years ago, inequality was very high. It, it then got much narrower in the middle decades of the 20th century, and it's going back up again. And this is the kind of this is the kind of narrative thrust which which Piketty makes, which is to say, oh, are you returning to this world of inequality which we experienced in the Victorian age? What I think is really interesting about this argument, well, a number of things are very interesting about the argument. One of them is the book proceeds by showing pictures like this time and again. Um, and that, but at the same time, with some counterfactuals, so you know, the US is a bit different from the Europe. Um, some of the measures of wealth are a bit different from, from income. Uh, these figures are very carefully constructed. Okay, so one of the points made is that it would look a bit different. This this visual begins at 25 percent. In this case, it, in, the, in this case, it's income inequality in the United States. It's the share of the top decile of earners as a proportion of the national income. And the U shape looks much more dramatic because it's got a 25% cut off point rather than a 0%. So the, the visuals are being used not in a kind of technically scientific way, but it's very carefully constructed, as all visuals are, of course. Um, so Piketty is not uh, acting as a kind of uh, uh, empiricist data person, although there's tons and tons of data in the book. He's acting as someone who's he's constructing a very aesthetically organized narrative using data and visuals which could not be possible without various kinds of digital uh, displays. And what recurs in the book is a kind of U-shaped thing like this. And that, I think that's what people come back to time and again. Second example, oops, second example, uh, if I'm right, is this one. You probably know the Spirit Level book, Wilkinson Pickett. Again, a massive bestseller in the UK. Um, and their big theme is uh, that economic growth does not solve social problems. This is what economists have usually argued, you know, as you create development, as development happens, problems go away, and if we raise people out of poverty, then things improve. And their big point is that's not the case because some, some rich societies in aggregate, particularly the USA, which is on the top right-hand corner, um, actually have more health and social problems that countries which are much less uh, well off in general terms, in aggregate terms, what really matters is the degree of, is the degree of inequality. So the more unequal societies are, um, the worse problems they have. And this is traced through with all sorts of measures of you know, 
you know, this is actually a compound which includes various kinds of health issues and life expectancy and whatnot, and, and, they, and they have lots of pictures like this. Yeah, one of the interesting about, things about this book, um, so it, it's a kind of notion of a data assemblage. So data is, is assembled together into big um, portfolios. In this case, it's different national sample surveys. Just like Piketty stuff, it's an assemblage of data rather than a unitary data source which gets mashed together and analysed. And then the, the book repeats time and again this basic graph. So it's a kind of repetitive, symphonic. There's a theme there. The theme gets reinforced and um, elaborated. And it sticks, with, it sticks in the mind of the viewer, in my view. And so I think many of the people who read that book and have got that idea from Wilkinson and Pickett that inequality is a bad thing, not economic poverty, have got it from various versions of this graph. So the, the data, if you like, is made powerful by repetition, thematic variation, occasional counterfactual, and a careful use of data in a narrative framework. So my, this is, my point here is the running and many of the exciting interventions by people using data in new ways are not being made by the big data community, who are this kind of computational people who don't really know how to tell a story. It's being made by certain kinds of social scientists who are using very you know, innovative data assemblages, um, but in ways which are crafted and constructed around aesthetic and narrative forms. And my final graph is this one here, which is the most recent one. I don't know, this is a bit less familiar, but it's become known, interestingly, as Mil Mil uh, Branko Milanovic is, one, again, another uh, well-known economist who's written about um, inequality trends. And it's actually interestingly become called the elephant graph because it looks a bit like an elephant. Um, trunk at the end there. Um, so very interesting, so a visual, this, is, this visual, has come, as if you look at the internet, you'll find this visual time and again. What Milanovic does, which is quite distinctive compared to, say, Piketty, is he mashes together a database of, the in, of many, many nations across the world. So it's not just look, comparing UK and US. He's trying to develop a global database on um, income trends in most nations, even including sub-Saharan Africa. Now, I don't want to get into the methodology of it, but it's a very impressive attempt to think about what does it mean to look at global inequality. And so what he's doing here is he's comparing income trends between 1988 and 2008 compared to where you stood in the global income distribution in 1988. So over here, we have the wealthiest people in the world, mainly living in the developed world, UK, uh, Europe and US. Over here, you've got people living in poor parts of the world. And Milanovic's point is actually, you know, we're, we're, very, we're very familiar with these people over here doing very well, top 1%. This is the kind of Piketty. So this is Piketty's bit of the visual. This is the U shape here. But, but uh, what Milanovic is saying is that actually in the emerging economies, India, South, South America, um, Asia, China, the middle classes there have actually done really, really well too. I mean, forget about these. Uh, this is an argument being made on the basis of, again, a narrative use of visualized data. And I think it's, and, uh, and uh, you, you see this time and again in, the, in inequalities research. Is it data which is, again, produced by an economist, but it's data which can be read by a wider community? So visuals are being used to, to mobilize wider constituencies. And I would therefore contend, you know, this is just a kind of back up Norch's point, that the debates now are not about are you for or against the digital, or, you know, should we be defending old methods or new methods? It's about how we develop innovative and persuasive ways of telling stories using aesthetic devices, using visualizations in ways which we think are powerful. And the running is, being is not being made by the big data community, I don't think. They're too empiricist, too attached to a kind of technocratic, technicist view of the world, you know, perhaps based upon animal behavior, as Norcher was saying earlier. It's actually being made by social scientists with the kind of uh, imaginative vision about how to tell important critical stories. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Hannah Noggs from UCL.
Okay, first of all, thanks again to Nordja for inviting me to come and talk at this event. It's really fantastic and it's so nice to be in an interdisciplinary conversation and to hear these different perspectives about our respective research methods and the things it throws up for us. Um, so I um, come from UCL, from the... Um, anthropology department at UCL where I um, convene a course on digital anthropology. So I was very much reading Norch's book from the perspective of um, the similarities and differences between digital sociology and digital anthropology. And I was really struck by more by the similarities than the differences, the, the shared preoccupations and the shared um, questions that seem to be, be coming up. And it surprised me in a way because I, I had an expectation that there would be more of a, a scalar difference between the the way in which um, the digital seems to offer something to sociology and the way in which it might offer something to the, the kind of grounded ethnographic methods um, conventionally associated with anthropology. So um, one way in which um, this kind of resonance between digital sociology and digital anthropology uh, kind of struck me when reading the book um, was when Norcher starts to kind of enter into a question of um, why digital sociology. So not just what is digital sociology, but why even have a category of something called digital um, sociology? Why not something like electric sociology? What is it about the digital that means that it warrants its whole field of inquiry? And this is very much a question that we also pose and we often say to our students when they first start the course, well, you know, why aren't you studying coffee anthropology? Why is it digital anthropology? Um, and we, we kind of have various answers to that question. But I think um, uh, Norcha provides one really compelling answer to that question that really carried through my reading of the book and I find really inspiring, um, which is an attention to the way in which um, digital devices are not like other objects in the world that we might decide to look at as social scientists. And one reason for this is that these digital devices are what she calls empirical technologies. So we've heard a little bit about this. Um, Les was talking, I think, a bit about this in what, in what he was um, reflecting on. Um, but I think this really kind of provides us with some interesting pointers as to why digital sociology has to be an interdisciplinary um, enterprise, why it requires um, collaboration and why we can't maintain a separation in the same way as we might have thought we were doing before uh, between the analytical work of sociologists and the analytical work that's taking place in all kinds of domains of social life through people's use of digital technologies. So whether that's quantified or whether that's people's self-analysis of their social media feeds or um, the, some of the things we've heard about around kind of disability and the body and how people understand that. Okay, so digital technologies then seem to uh, allow a massively kind of expanded range of people to suddenly be able to become social scientists, to become sociologists. And this is such a really interesting um, proposition. Um, and there have obviously been others who've recognised that our research participants are not cultural or social dupes. They are active participants in world making and they've always been engaged in processes of, of analysing and philosophising about the worlds that they live in. Um, but I think there's something quite specific about Norcher's um, claim, um, which is not just that people analyse and converse and make judgments about the world, but that there is increasingly a blurring uh, between the methodological tools that sociology uses to do this and the methodological tools that people are using in their everyday life in order to make sense of social phenomena. Okay, so... Um, this resonates very um, strongly with um, research that I've been doing and it really helps me to think about some of the things that I've been looking at in my research and some of the things that I'm trying to kind of think about uh, moving forward. So in the time that I've got left, I'm going to really just kind of spin off from that observation in the book to talk a bit um, about um, my research and, and to come up hopefully with some uh, kind of question at the end for, for Norcha. So in recent years, one of the things that I've been studying is I've been looking at um, very much uh, at issues around um, climate change and particularly focusing on climate models and visualizations of environmental processes. Um, and the particular focus that I've had on those uh, processes of visualization um, has been on the way in which this representation of number and data 
gets kind of incorporated into situated um, social relations and in particular the way in which people situate and understand themselves um, politically. So I've done research with um, scientists and I've been really interested in ways in which um, scientists who are producing uh, visualizations and analyses of global climate processes um, are themselves ha finding themselves having to become sociologists or anthropologists um, as they start to analyze what is this data. This data that we're looking at is evidence of not just natural processes but social processes as well. Um, and similarly, um, I've, I've done work with the policymakers who are then provoked by these um, forms of kind of data visualization um, into trying to think about what kinds of policy interventions they can make. Um, and so this includes things like people analyzing um, graphs of carbon emissions um, and trying to, and, and in a way, being presented by these data fields and then having to make sense of them as kind of social theorists. And I think what I've been struck by, rather in contrast to what Mike was describing, um, is not that people are, are explicitly going out to use data to craft narratives about the world, but rather they find themselves confronted by representations of complex processes where they're invited to make interpretations about it and they require sociological skills to do that. And so that's become, that that's, seems to be very kind of um, relevant to this question of how, what happens when more people are being asked to become sociologists. So one um, organization, kind of group of people that I did some research with um, was uh, a group of people who were much more explicitly kind of uh, responding to this question of what happens when we could take the data and the devices, the digital devices that we have at our disposal, and we could actually kind of actively um, try to um, engage those in order to intervene in energy and climate politics. Um, and so this particular group of people were using open source technologies to get householders to build their own energy monitors. And what they were trying to do was they were trying to get people um, not just to understand how much energy they were using so that they could reduce, the, uh, reduce their energy consumption and change their behaviors in a rather kind of um, reductive sense, but they were also um, asking people to engage with digital devices and engage with the data that was being pr produced by digital devices to reconceive of the world that they were living in. So to understand in a really different sense the energy infrastructures and the relationships that constitute the energy system within which they were located. So people were in the workshop and they were soldering um, um, Arduino, uh, um, Raspberry Pi computer chips and trying to program uh, them with um, Arduino programming language and all kinds of questions that we might ask as social scientists were being posed. Well, what about the materiality of the objects that we're actually uh, producing? Where do they come from? What are the labor relations of the people who are producing the materials that go into these things that, that we're now using as our energy monitors in our homes? How do we measure the relationship between energy and finance? How do we even know what the makeup of the energy mix is? How would we find that out? Um, what kinds of places would we have to go to ask those questions and unravel those relationships? Um, and as this, as this conversation proceeded, I felt a, a kind of sense of disorientation as there was a, a seeming kind of collapse of the work of the people with whom I was doing research and the kinds of research questions that I myself might have as a, someone who's interested in um, an attention to infrastructure as a way of understanding social worlds. So here we have people who are becoming sociologists, becoming social scientists, but I, but, but I think there, there was something about the kind of unsettling qualities um, of that um, space where differentiation collapses that I wanted to kind of draw attention to that maybe isn't uh, dwelt on in as much detail as it could have been in, in Norch's book. So to, to conclude, um, I, 
I've been continuing to work with these group of people, and um, over the next year, we're now going to do uh, attempt to do a joint uh, research project, building on their expertise as computer programmers, as architects, as engineers, and as nascent social scientists, and my own um, background as an anthropologist, as someone reading digital sociology, of thinking about these methods of intervention, to see what we can produce as um, a participatory project in this um, ambition to rethink the energy system, rethink what smart energy might be, what community energy might be. Um, and so this brings me to kind of a final point, which is a point about interdisciplinarity and expertise. Because we have um, a very strong argument that digital methods require interdisciplinary expertise. And we also have an argument that people who were not necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily have seen as sociologists are doing sociological work. But this unsettled this kind of unsettling quality of trying to work together to produce something that's neither computer science nor actually sociology nor anthropology leads me to a kind of final question as to whether we are really all becoming digital sociologists or whether indeed there's new forms of expertise and different new kinds of knowledge and new kinds of um, capabilities and capacities that might be emerging in rather maybe in rather tentative ways in the interstices between these different kinds of expert groups who get brought together um, with, with these kinds of digital technologies. So yeah, just keep this mic here and then we have another mic uh, for the questions. Uh, so anybody want to raise their hand? I think it's a particularly optimistic book, which is quite nice for once. Um, I'm a, I must confess I'm a geographer, not a sociologist, but again, we're having the same debates in geography about the digital. Uh, my question really is about the digital versus a digital or a series of digital systems. So we seem to be talking about the digital as one thing, but what we're actually talking about is a number of different <coughs> digital systems. And while these systems aren't necessarily closed, they aren't all, all doing things all at once. So Facebook is different from Twitter. Twitter is different from the network which runs in the London Underground, or airports, etc. And perhaps, rather than talking about the digital, we're talking about a digital, and then, because of that, we should think about tools and methodologies to sort of research different digital systems. Um, yeah, that's just one of my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things I cite is a, a journalist, uh, John Lanchester, who wrote this piece, I think, in the London Review of Books about uh, the Snowden uh, leaks, and what he said about that leak um, was that there's all these different files, all, this di all these different kinds of documents and information that was made available in that event. But it doesn't really matter what the precise format was or the precise status, what matters was that it was digital. Because that made possible a circulation of these materials um, but also a, um, a way of um, assembling uh, them. Um, and that really struck, like it stuck with me, um, that especially like a lot of my previous work was in science and technology studies, where, is all, there's, where there's a lot of emphasis on specificity, like different formats have different affordances or different technologies have slightly different implications for our... And this somehow, this indiscriminate um, quality of digital materials to me became like, important um, also in terms of what I'm, my optimism is about, that the digital brings different um, actors into relation, different methods, different disciplines. And so that kind of, yeah, relative undeterminacy is important to me. I feel really privileged that I'm actually uh, a student or a, a part of the process of this book coming out. I was on the master's program of digital sociology. Hey, Les. <laughs> um, but I, I think um, what would be a really interesting question would be, I think what we've heard from the panel is that everyone's a digital sociologist, 
but not quite anyone is a digital sociologist. So what is a digital sociologist and how do you become one? <laughs> Do you want to start? You've been sure. running the yeah. course, okay. but you're running a course yeah. too. Yeah. I'm running a course in digital anthropology. anthropology. Yeah. 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 Uh, we could, we could. Uh, there's so many different ways of taking it on, but mm. one is maybe also in going back to some points by Les and um, Hannah that I do think that the the way in which methods circulate. So one of the uh, images in the book is. Uh, of a meme that says, you call it Facebook stalking, mm. but we call it participant observation. <laughs> so, um, you know, virtual ethnography and uh, bad social media habits are uh, disturbingly uh, close to each other. And I do think that, that a lot of um, the very methodical um, speaking about computational social science has to do with the nervousness mm. around that collapse um, of, of, of distinctions. Um, but at the same time, I do think becoming a digital sociologist is about uh, acquiring problems, uh, of, of, about having problems, which is where the book ends, in that um, I really was really struck also by the way in which different students in the pro uh, program latched onto very specific concerns, whether it is with um, a particular algorithm, uh, the people you may know algorithm, which does this triadic uh, disclosure that you were talking about, of, uh, making um, uh, users known to each other. Um, and that having, why is it so important to, to latch on this particular phenomena and then see how there are problems in that I really do think that a lot of digital sociology is about turning methods into problems. So yes, we, it is important to know about Georg <laughs> Simmel's notion of triadic closure and how social networks form, but when that gets deployed, uh, to maximize uh, connectivity in a user population, what really happens to what Simo was set out to measure, namely friendship. Um, so that, that problem, problematization thing, for instance, the phenomenon of friendship becoming a, a problem. Um, yeah, so I do think becoming a digital sociologist is about acquiring problems. But um, yeah, some of these problems are very hard to take, like the the mobile phone, the potential of that mm. object. I think the, one of the answers to the question about what a digital, digital, digital sociologist is, in a way, we all, we all are digital sociologists in one way or another. The question is how, not if we, if we are or not. But one question, I mean, you, from your book, you clearly have considerable technical skills, it seems to me. You know, you, you can do some of the programming. Is that, I mean, would you, do you think sociology students need to learn programming skills as part of... Sociology degree these days. Yeah, I mean, um, I think one that m one of the most interesting interesting things about digital sociology is that skills become important to doing social research that weren't before. Uh, like at uh, Sim uh, in Warwick, um, we're now working on um, whether the students need to be taught R. At the same time, I am more and more worried about the analytic frameworks that piggyback on those skills. Mm -hmm. So that um, representational frameworks, as in one analyzes a phenomenon and, and <coughs> the, the way in which that analysis might intervene in the phenomenon is of no concern. concern. For instance, that assumption, I, I, I see that with technical and data analytic skills, analytic frameworks come along that, that I think are not sociological or might risk to be even anti-sociological. And so that's, um, I mean, having problems is, is sort of an intermediate uh, way of dealing with that. But it's somehow that I, uh, I think that is a contribution that sociologists can make in this space where these different skill, skills become more important. Yeah. 
Hi. Um, I'm a BA ceramic student, and I don't come to the, from the soci sociological field. For me, it's everything new what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm interested in, interested in, in the theme. Uh, what I think is, from the point of view of a user, what I, I, I have not read the book, so I cannot, <laughs> but I feel that as a user of the digital, the, the digital world, it's so difficult to find the truth of any information. I think the people that know, uh, has the knowledge and uh, is up to the game, we don't know their names, we don't know the, we don't know who are the real gamers that we can trust. And uh, it's, each time that we get the internet, it's, it's frightening. It's, 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 you just know that they are using all the time anything. And uh, for example, now my husband just come back from Denmark, and he said that his mother now is using a private server that access internet for her, for they don't have access to her data. And, uh, but then he said, but she does has um, no information about this server. She doesn't know who she, she, uh, she's trusting. Mm, mm, so mm. it's, what you think about, how you, uh, what you could say, a uh, tip <laughs> for a, a, a normal user of the digital. I was just gonna say there's a really beautiful piece that got published yesterday on uh, on the website uh, for 4S uh, in the blog area called Back Channels. And there's a PhD student working with environmental uh, data in the US and is talking about how we move our data when we travel back to, say, as an international student from the US back to Austria. And he does a really lovely um, job at trying to, to, to describe what it was like to be doing a PhD and the data to disappear, but not necessarily be deleted, but to also have access to some of that data. And then what happens when you go to travel home with that data. And I think it's a really lovely piece by a PhD student uh, working and staying in the trouble of, of trying to do research. So um, it's by Leo Bat Batchinger and it's on uh, a website called Back Channels. So just type in Back Channels 4S Leo. It's the, the first on the, it's the most recent one on silenced issues at the moment. I'll add something in that I think that it is obviously a concern for people, the invisibility of what's happening behind the scenes when you're using these technologies. But in a sense, it, it's a continuity of the social sciences to unravel those hidden relationships and that hidden politics. And in a sense, that's what, we, that's what I think we've always tried to do, is uncover and unpack the, the, the relationships that are, are hidden by institutional structures, by by media, by different kinds of infrastructures that that are not self-evident. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's not to say there's not particular issues at play um, around ownership of data, around access, around algorithms that we need to be studying. But we need to be studying those in the same way that we've studied other infrastructures and other structures mm -hmm. of, of um, power and control historically as well. And I think there's a lot of resources sociology, anthropology, geography has for, for, for analysing those. But there's also a lot of work to be done because it's a big set of issues and there's lots of people involved. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for your contributions. It's been a really interesting panel and I'm really looking forward to reading the book. What was particularly striking for me was your introduction, Nortra, in, in talking about timing. And I heard that coming through quite a few people's contributions. But I wanted you to talk a little bit more, if anyone else wants to as well, about timing. Because clearly this is about positionality and timing, particularly digital sociology. Um, and I, I want to hear a little bit more about you saying that your book was written at a particular time between two kind of edges. How would it be different now if you were writing it? Um, and would it be so optimistic? Oh. <laughs> well, the time of writing, I think, for me, was a very expansive time, uh, both in that it took me a lot more than between Brexit and Trump uh, to write it. So uh, I think I probably started, like, at least... Uh, three and a half years ago, four years ago. Uh, but also because in writing it, um, it, it became a lot about old sociology. So um, 
Max Weber, um, what is social action? It is action that is orientated towards the accounts that others will give of that action, which to me sounds like a pretty good um, description of a lot of what goes on in social media. Um, and there are other sociologists, uh, Harold Garfinkel, on the circulation of uh, methodical accounts, uh, how a lot of uh, social life is always already methodical, uh, which uh, then requires different ways of doing social research. Uh, once we don't take us, sociologists, to be the, the only ones to be methodical. Um, so in that sense, like one of the almost one of the re yeah one of the reasons to do this thing called book writing is to be in that time where you can make those kind of connections at the same time um about the optimism i think frankly it would have been a lot less optimistic at the same time when i work with students when i speak with colleagues uh, this kind of um taste for uh, thinking, this taste for uh, analyzing current phenomena. Yeah, if, I, if we don't have that appetite or taste mm. for it, um, yeah. But I'm, I probably told you and others, I'm starting to work on cars. And part of it is that it's impossible to be optimistic about cars, I think, so, like, yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think reflecting upon the kind of uh, the, 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 the histori historicity <coughs> of big data and, and questioning, the, questioning the kind of epochism of it, certainly is, is that before and after is, is, is crucial. I, I also think it's a matter of, it's part, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, about how we then try and ourselves rethink how we see time and, and, and use that to critique notions of just that there's this big data world out there which is threatening us is part of what we need to be doing. In terms of the optimism and pessimism, yeah, um, <laughs> I, think we have to, I think we have to just try and be optimistic. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of reasons to be pessimistic, but I th and clearly, you know, with, you know uh, the way social media has been used in recent election campaigns is very, is very worrying, but I think we still have to be in this world and try to turn it to our purposes rather than just saying it's terrible and nasty out there. So, I, I mean, I don't have any particular skills about how to do that, but I, th I think we've got to keep on pushing. I think it's really interesting, Nortje, that you've moved from um, this book to, to cars and, I, <laughs> and the, to less optimistic. And, uh, you know, at the moment I'm struggling with work uh, around the Ministry of Defence, and I feel like I'm in exactly that same pessimistic space. Um, so I, 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 w I hope that we turn <laughs> beyond those spaces uh, and how long, whether it will be three years again, to be in that space about cars. I hope not, actually. There's cyclists in that space, too. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My question follows on from the very first one, but as a disclaimer, I haven't read the book yet, but as a worry colleague, we've had various discussions. And what really strikes me about um, um, the digital is kind of how it creates a blurring, it seems to me, between reality and fiction. Um, and be, where digital users kind of, you know, co-construct new realities, spectacles, new worlds, which may or not reflect, you know, the real world. Um, talking about inequalities, I, you know, I'm reminded of Celia Lurie's work um, on the cloud score, which creates completely new inequalities. So I just, w just wonder whether the digital sociologist um, has to take on kind of a new epistemological stance towards the object of research. Does this imply kind of a shift? Do we need to treat the digital in any way different? Are we just studying fictions? Um, or should we just not discriminate at all between the digital and kind of the, the non-digital world? I'm not so sure those distinctions are so stable, actually. I was listening to what other people were saying as they were saying, well, what is this thing, digital sociology, and how do you become one? I just, part of me thinks, well, actually, it's about the informational environment in which we inhabit the social. So it becomes almost like a non-question, in a way. And following the, you know, the affordances of the problems that emerge in that world, seem to be where the important problems and questions are. So it, it means, you know, 
that they're, they're acquiring those skills or a capacity to know what those skills uh, involve. I mean, I, I think that the, the most profound kind of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work happens when you learn a little bit of the skill that you can't really do that well, but you understand what that takes, you know, and, and the kinds of imagination that, that are required to, to really, you know, hold those tools, to hold those tools the right way up. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's a, you know, a radical break in terms of the epistemology. I think there's so much that's important about the questions that come from the simple problem about how do you weigh the analytical status of the data we're trying to understand and argue with. You know, those are, those are very old established problems within research epistemology. They become newly invigorated in the digital world, but I'm not sure there's a break between in a way, that's why I think working together across different skills, um, why it's an important thing. And I don't think Nortcher's book is an optimistic book, forgive me, or only an optimistic book, because I, I read it in other ways of, of, as a prof profound kind of insight into the damage of the informational age and the informational environment in which we operate in two. So there's the, both the sort of paradoxical po possibility and also the damage. Adding um, briefly that one of the things digital sociology does is watching the fictions unravel. So it's, the book starts with um, uh, the Samaritan Radar, a Twitter-based tool for identifying people at risk of suicide. And there are other of these kind of can-do uh, examples in the book of you know, apps for um, um, communities to, to manage uh, their road infrastructures by reporting potholes, uh, through smartphone apps and doing digital sociology is watching those seemingly naive propositions unleash all sorts of dynamics around, in the case of Samaritan Radar, the stigmatization, um, uh, self-censorship implications of that kind of a tool. In the case of the pothole reporting, the, um, uh, the revelation of differences in infrastructural investment between neighborhoods that have iPhones and neighborhoods that don't. Um, so I think there's also, a, yes, there are a lot of fictions uh, that keep the digital economy spinning, uh, but there is also a lot of reporting um, infrastructures uh, being patched together in so many different places that can reveal the unraveling of those fictions. And, yeah. and that that's a job to to, to also uh, contribute. I just wanted to ask you to maybe say, a, think a little bit more, or just reflect a bit more on the impact that the digital has on disciplines and disciplinarity and why it is such an interdisciplinary moment and what that means. So I'm, I'm so interested that you called the book Digital Sociology, you're making a claim in, do, in doing that. And um, both myself, my colleague here, are both sociologists working in a digital humanities lab. Mm. And that's a really, really interesting experience because um, it's interesting to be marginal always. You know, you learn a lot more on the margins than the centre. But the, the digital humanities people spend a lot of time thinking about the human because they think, so what does the digital tell us to think about in terms of how does it get us to reflect on our discipline? How do we reinvent what the human might mean in the digital age? And it feels to me that sociology has a much harder time, actually, picking up the gauntlet of the digital. Well, maybe not a hard time. It's a different project. That's what's really, really clear. It's, a, it's quite a different project. It's a much more modernist project in many ways, historically. And it's, we're implicated in technologies, perhaps in the ways the humanists aren't, um, in terms of their vision of the discipline. So I'm interested in, um, in why you called it digital sociology. And maybe what would it be called if you hadn't used that title? Mm. So what's the other name? What could it otherwise <laughs> be known as? And yeah, do you think sociology is in trouble in this moment? <clears throat> what's, what does it say? Because to me, it doesn't feel terribly strong in this moment, I have to say. And I'm, I'm speaking as a sociologist who loves sociology, but it doesn't feel at like the centre of everything in, in a way that you might have imagined it would have been. Well, there's a, one chapter that starts with, it's a sociological machine. Mm -hmm. which is a, a, a student speaking about um, Google. And there are 
I then discuss in that chapter some of the um, reasons why you could call Google a sociological machine, as in um, there is a um, relative spontaneity to the queries that Google uh, gathers and assembles. For instance, it's, it's not um, a, a controlled, formatted uh, research situation, as in a focus group, uh, for instance. And I mean, we could get into uh, more detail there. Also, um, I discuss in the book um, these dynamics where uh, the auto suggest function in Google uh, suggests basically racist queries and misogynist mm. queries. And how is it that an algorithm uh, comes to uh, uh, settle? on these suggestions based on the analysis of a collective of queries. And I think when, when you work on those kind of questions, you are, for me, in the, in the middle of sociology. Mm. I mean, these are socio-technical processes in which stereotypical views get amplified, in which majority, the view of the majority, majority for, views form. Um, which is, I think, a, a social process that we're very much dealing with today, at least as much as with the question, what is, what is it to be human? Um, but at the same time, um, yeah, I think they're, they're the kind of, the, both the kind of rigor that you need in order to say, this is, uh, this is the project of sociology as the in the digital humanities. There have been these very rigorous formulations of what is the project of digital humanities. That it is hard to do precisely because of the, the strong investments in compute, computational social science, which give a ready-made uh, answer to that. So there, it's the, the, the problem of proximity, in a way, which is also where things like... Um, you know, what are specific ways of using data analysis that contribute to doing sociological analysis that it also may be that more of that detailed, which is less spectacular. I wanted to also propose the sense that the social of sociology has been produced historically through particular kinds of methods. And I think there is a really interesting question about what, ha what happens when your methods change and whether your object of study changes at the same time. And I think maybe it comes back to that question about epistemology. And maybe well, the, the tension is not, is not just it always less the digital side of the digital sociology but the sociology side and like maybe the sense of kind of un what's being unsettled is the sense that we don't uh, it's hard to know what the object of digital sociology is if it's not society in the way in which we understood it through other kind of survey based methods for example could uh, digital sociology uh, should digital sociology be more interventionist than other kinds of sociology <laughs> I think it's a tricky a tricky one given that we're um, in the triadic space of we know each other in several uh, <laughs> ways. I think there, there are very strong expectations around how knowledge can be made relevant, how it can contribute to solving a problem. And these are uh, stories about being impactful in your research, uh, but there are also stories about being specific uh, in terms of like aiming for measurable um, influence mm -hmm. on, say, a, a given policy space. And that when I look at digital platforms, digital devices, I, I, what I see and what I engage with is a space that is far more complex, far more dynamic, far more alive mm -hmm. than that. And so what I find myself in, in, in the middle of is on the one hand, respecting, want, like clearly this call for intervention is a very important one, but at the same time, this kind of knowledge that we can make digitally, mm -hmm. is, it, is a, it is a moving beast. So. Yeah. To, in that sense, to have a kind of styles of intervention that are a bit to the side, 
or oblique uh, may yeah, there may be a point to those. And then, of course, uh, there are the crazy ironies that um, within, you know, digital industries, what I just said is like, ta-da. It's not, it's not particularly surprising, even though um, in other public contexts, those other understandings of impact are very much what frames um, the space. So it's a private-public problem as well. I think we're going to draw this to a close, this phase. Uh, on behalf of UAL, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Do, uh, uh, if you're, uh, hopefully we might add you to our mailing list, or might that be annoying, or follow us on Twitter anyway. Um, but thank you very much, and um, I'm going to hand over to Norcha. Yeah, now. I also wanted to thank Lucy, but I wanted to thank... Um, the four of you to take time to read and respond and I have been scribbling and um, yeah I have various responses that will come in other uh, moments um, and I also wanted to thank uh, the Center for Interdisciplinary Methodology which contributed uh, to this event and for coming uh, to Emma Bridget for coming and others for coming and lastly to Manu Lux who um, is a artist who produced what she described to me as a point cloud rendering. That is what this is, a point cloud rendering um, of a library in a company called Madras, which is a smart city developer in Abu Dhabi. And she made this film and this point cloud rendering is a way of filming where the camera measures uh, the distance to different points and then composes an image out of all those measurements and this is the library and she somehow said the library in the smart city corporation headquarters um, is the image that um, can do can can work um, here and I was very pleased that she came up with that so please so. stay and join us for a drink and for signing of the book which apparently is only 12 pounds yes thank you <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you.